Welcome, everybody. As Eric said, my name is Jacob Knight, and I'm an area director at Eastern Illinois University. Um, today's presentation is being brought to you by the Glacujo Student Learning Committee. And we would like to plug in and make sure that you're aware that if any of you are attending the annual conference, the Student Learning Committee will be doing a lunch session, which will focus on living learning communities. If you are interested in participating in this event, meet at registration on Tuesday, November 6th, and lunch will be at Max and Irma. Now, I'm very excited to introduce our presenter for today, Amanda Kinner. Amanda is the Senior Associate Director of Residential Life at Pennsylvania State University, and she is the Chair-Elect for ACPA's Directorate for the Commission for Assessment and Evaluation. Now I'm going to turn things over to Amanda and allow her to further introduce herself and today's topic. Thank you very much. Um, I want to thank everyone for inviting me to present a session on assessment for the Glacujo region. Um, Glacujo is very near and dear to my heart. I did both my undergraduate work and my graduate work within the Glacujo region, so it's really nice to come back and have an opportunity to visit with all of you today about a, a, a topic that I'm very passionate about. Um, I started working in assessment during my graduate program. I had only been in a master's program for a couple of weeks, and I was sitting in a residence hall director's meeting, and somebody came in and said, hey, we're doing this great assessment project. You're going to get a talk with students. You're going to get reports back um, that you can then use with students in disciplinary meeting and, and in programming and to find student leaders. And I thought, wow, what a great idea. I've never really thought of assessment. I've never really thought about how it could be applied to what I'm doing. Um, and so I ended up doing some internships and some independent studies with the Institutional Research Office at my home institution. And from there, have just really found um, a great opportunity with an assessment to improve our work and to improve our practice. Today I'm going to talk about three different areas. We're going to spend a little bit of time just talking about why do we need to plan assessment. If you want to do an assessment project, why can't we just jump right into it? Why is it important to have that planning? Then we'll go into how exactly do I plan an assessment project. And the focus is really going to be on assessment projects you can use in your individual buildings or halls, and not necessarily department-wide or division-wide assessment plans, um, although that's another direction that you can take. We're then going to talk about some very, what I call, quick and dirty assessments that you can take, prepare in five or six minutes, and then use in programs and initiatives um, and disciplinary conferences with students to get some information very, very quickly. They're a great way for beginners and assessment to start getting some information and learning how to use it to impact their practice. And then we'll wrap up with sharing some concrete examples that I have from some of the assessment work I've done um, here and at other institutions over the course of my career, just to give you an idea of how to frame things, how to work through things, some of the mistakes and some of the challenges we've encountered along the way, and then how it's impacted practice. So to get going, Again, our agenda for today, we're going to do some quick learning outcomes, talk about why we're planning, uh, talk about the seven steps that you need to do in order to plan an ass effective assessment. We'll go through those quick assessments for beginners, talk about some examples in action, and then the takeaway homework is just a worksheet that you can take away with you so that as you get going in your own individual buildings, planning assessment work, you can go through the different questions and know where to start. I'm hoping that at the end of this session today that you're going to be able to talk briefly about each of the steps in the assessment planning process, why they're important, what types of questions to consider as you're going through them, and then I hope that you'll be able to name and describe two what we call active assessments, which are those nitty-gritty assessments that you can plan in about five or six minutes and then put into place immediately within your residence hall or community. And then finally, that you can select one of those appropriate active assessments for that specific activity program or initiative so you can understand what types of questions or information that you want to get and then which assessment activity will get you the best information to answer the question or to determine whether or not your students have learned what you want them to have learned in your residence halls. So to get started, why, why spend any time planning assessment? Um, having worked in residence life my entire career, I know that our plates are always overflow with work that we need to do, right? We're constantly going from one crisis to another, from one supervisory meeting to one staff meeting to a program to event, and then it's the end of the day and we get back up and do it all over again. So when people say, you have to do assessment, initially it can be like, oh, one more thing to add to my plate. So why do I need to take time to plan it? Because that just takes more work and more time that I don't have. 
But as Randy Swing said, effective research can often save us time in the long run, and it makes us more effective in our work with students. If we take that time up front to make sure that the assessment is done well, it's going to get us information that's going to help us eliminate programs and services that are redundant or are no longer meeting student needs. It's going to help us know our students better so that we can more effectively program and provide initiatives and, and learning opportunities for them. Um, and it's going to then save us time later on in our position. So it's really important to take that time up front, even though we're really busy to get that research done. The other thing is the best assessment programs always share timely information in a variety of ways. And one of the things with assessment planning is that it helps you figure out what is the best time to gather that information and then how do you share it in time so that it can be effectively used for decision making. And we'll talk about some examples of that here in a little bit. And finally, assessment needs to improve practice. If it's not improving practice, it is wasting people's time, energy, and attention. I have several assessment reports sitting on my desk right now that's collecting dust. They looked and sounded very exciting when we got started, but we got them all done and got them written up. And now they're interesting, but maybe they weren't put out in a timely manner, or maybe they're so long you don't have time to get through them, but they sit there and collect dust. And that isn't worth our time, especially when we're so busy. So if we carefully plan assessments and we then put them into, into place in, a, in necessary programs that's going to help us make good decisions, um, then those, those reports don't sit on your desk and collect dust. They become integrated into the very fabric of our job, and it's just part of what we do, and they're constantly being utilized to, to improve that practice. And then it's no longer a waste of time, and it's worth paying attention to. So that's a little bit about why we need to take some time to plan assessment. We're going to talk next about the seven steps to planning an assessment. We're going to go through this pretty quickly, because I'd really like to spend the bulk of our time talking about some assessments that you can take with you and use, as well as the examples in action. So the seven steps. The first one is asking yourself, what exactly is the purpose of this assessment? What are we trying to understand about our programs, about our services, about our students? Do we want to know what students are learning? Do we want to know whether they're satisfied with something going on in our residence halls? Do we want to know if our facilities are meeting the needs of today's students? What exactly do we want to know? Once we know what the question is that we want to ask, what that information is we want to know, then and only then, can we pick what methodology is most appropriate to collect information? So many times I sit in assessment committees, and the first question or the first statement out of somebody's mouth is, we need to plan a survey. Well, how do you know that the survey is actually the best piece of information or the best way to collect information? What you really need to start is back up, begin with the, the end in mind, and say, what do we want to do with this information? What questions do we have? And then which type of method or which type of data collection is going to get us the information in ways that make the most sense? The, the next question or the next step is determining what the project timeline is. And again, start with the end in mind. When do the stakeholders have to have that information in their hands in order to make a decision in a way that they can use it to improve practice? And then back up from there, how much time is it going to take you to write the reports for the different audiences that you have? How much time is it going to take you to analyze the data? From there, how much time is it going to take to collect the data? And then how much time is it going to take to develop the instrument and do all the planning? So one thing I'd caution here, and we'll go through this a little bit more in a little bit, is give yourself more time than what you think. Oftentimes, people will say, I can do a survey in a couple of hours. I can collect it next week and have a report in two weeks. Most of the time, that's not really realistic. It's going to take a little bit longer than that to do your questions, particularly if you're at a large institution where there's lots of layers of approval you need to go through before you can get things implemented. And so always give yourself more time at the data collection stage and the data analysis and report writing stage so that you can still get it to the stakeholders in a timely manner to make decisions. Next, how will the information be used? Are you planning on using it to allocate budget funding, to decide whether a program is going to continue or not, to see if staff are doing a good job or if students are satisfied, or is it going to be used um, for marketing materials, for parents, for students, for external audiences? Knowing how that information will be used in the planning stage helps you understand what types of information you need to collect, what your questions really are, and then how that information is going to be shared, which is the next step in the process, thinking through how are you going to share that information with the key stakeholders. For example, 
if my key stakeholders are faculty members, I'm going to prepare that information very differently than if the people I'm going to share it with are students or parents or a marketing material. So thinking about which audience members I'm going to share it with and how they like to get that information and the planning stages saves you hours of time when you're going about writing the report. The next step, or how are you assigning responsibilities to get this done? Who's going to be developing the instrument? Who's analyzing the information? Who's reporting it to the stakeholders? Who's making the decisions with the data? Are you getting IRB approval? All the different test steps during the assessment process, having a place where you can send, spend some time saying who's going to be accountable for that step and how are you going to hold people accountable to do the job that they need to do is really important that you don't end up six months from now thinking, geez, we should have gotten this done, but nobody really followed through on what needed to happen. And then finally, and this is the piece that's often neglected in assessment planning, is thinking about how am I going to assess this instrument at the end? In other words, how am I going to make sure that at the end of the day when this project is done, that I spend time thinking about if I have to do this again in another year or in another six months, what worked well with the instrument, what didn't work well, did the report meet the needs of the stakeholders? Did we ask the right questions? So spending time reflecting on the whole project and the whole process and then making changes or keeping notes so that if you have to do another assessment project or do the identical assessment project at some time in the future, you can jump right into it and get moving. Now we're going to go in a little bit more depth about each of those steps. First question is, what, what exactly is the purpose of the assessment? And there are really two different types of assessment. There's a formative assessment, which is really talking about getting information on improving a current process or a strategy, um, assessing how students are learning through our RA class, for example, or over the course of the year, are students getting stuff out of the programs? Are they learning about the initiatives and the living learning environment? Making those, I want to improve my practice. I want to improve what we're doing with the program or initiatives. And so we're going to get information about whether a program is really strong, where are the opportunities for growth in a program, what are the participant needs and are we meeting those needs currently, are there areas where we really need to focus our attention because we're just not doing a great job there, maybe looking at longitudinal trends. We do a quality of life survey every year and one of the areas we're really looking at is students locking doors. We have lots of you know theft issues and, and we're doing some intentional programming around getting people to understand why it's important to lock their room door. So are we seeing an increase in the number of students who are saying, yeah, I lock my door every time I leave my room? So we might be looking at those longitudinal trends. And then creating some implications or suggestions for improvement. The other kind of or purpose for assessment is kind of a summative assessment. So let's say you're doing a program series in your hall and it's all done and you just want a summary of the effectiveness of that program. That would be more of a summative assessment. You're not necessarily going to look to improve the next one because it's over again but you do want to have a final understanding of the impact that that program series had on the student, whether it was a satisfying experience, and what the strengths were of that program. Um, did it effectively meet the outcomes that were laid out initially for that program? So again, formative assessment and summative assessment. The other thing you want to do during the purpose section of the assessment is, again, what is the main question that you want to ask? Or what is the main piece of information that you, as an individual in your hall, or your committee is interested in knowing and writing those questions out. It's very easy as you start thinking about those purposes of assessment for it to start out with one or two areas and then you start talking and you say, oh, but wouldn't it be interesting to know this? Or, oh, gosh, it would be also really exciting if we knew how it impacted um, this particular subpopulation of students or how does it impact their out-of-class learning. And the next thing you know, you've got 15 purpose questions or main ideas for the, for the assessment project. And you know what? It's not going to be successful then. So part of that, spending some time thinking about the purpose of assessment is really narrowing that scope, so that you're really focusing on the most important information that's the most useful. It's so easy to get sucked into I for this is really interesting versus you for this is useful and this is what we need for this project. So if you spend some time thinking about this purpose and talking about this purpose in the planning stages, it's a lot less likely that you're going to expand to get all the interesting and get this huge project that isn't going to be successful. So once you've come up with the purpose for your, of your assessment, the, what am I trying to collect, what do I want to know about this project, then you can start thinking about what methodology is most appropriate for you to use. 
for example, you might just be asking yourself, what's the best way to get at the purpose question? Is it really through a survey? Do I want numbers saying I really agree, I don't agree? Do I really need to hear stories? If you're talking about um, a student's experience in a living learning community, then you might really want to know their experience during the first week of the semester when you're doing all sorts of community building and orientation to the living community and setting the expectations. So maybe you want to do an interview or a focus group where you get that rich, deep, thick stories and the numbers of how many people attended programs isn't as useful to you. So understanding what's the best way to get at the information that is answering your question so you're not going out collecting information that at the end of the day isn't what you really need to answer that purpose statement. The next question is who has the information? Does it already exist out there? So many times we go out and survey our students over and over and over and over again but the information is already within another survey or the information is already collected somewhere out there and all we have to do is pull that information and use it without having to have the students do another assessment. Asking yourself, why do you want the information? If it's to present to faculty, they might really want statistics and the analysis. If you're presenting it to coordinators, they love to hear the stories because they want to impact people and impact students. And so if they're hearing the stories in their assessment, then that's going to resonate with them where the numbers might make them run from fear. So knowing how, why you want the information, what you're planning to do with the information, and how you're going to share that information helps you decide what methodology is going to make the most sense to get the information that you need for the audience that you're going to be sharing it with. And then again, going back one more time and revisiting, is this information that I'm trying to collect with this appropriate methodology is it essential to answer the purpose of my assessment, or is it just something that's really interesting? Sometimes interesting is OK, but most of the time you want to steer away from all the extras and really focus on what the purpose is of the information or the assessment that you're doing. After you move and say, OK, we're going to do a survey, we're going to do a focus group, we're going to do interviews, once you've selected that, then you go on to what your project timeline is making sure that you plan enough time to plan the assessment, to create a timeline for when the reports are going to be done and some time for analysis and implementation. We talked about that. But a couple things we haven't talked about is how long the assessment will take the participants. I would say that most of the time if a survey instrument, even especially if it's online, if it takes more than five minutes to do, people are typically not going to complete that assessment. Maybe as long as seven if it's something that's really exciting. But if they're talking about quiet hours or facilities, probably five minutes or less if you want them to complete the assessment. If you're asking students to participate in a focus group and you tell them to block three hours of their time, you're going to have a hard sell with that. But if you're asking them to come over a meal time and they're going to give them some food and they're going to spend an hour or an hour and a half, they might be more willing to, 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 to submit to that time and to participate in an assessment. So thinking very carefully about what time commitment you're asking for those participants and how often you're asking them to participate in an assessment is really important. The other thing is when do the stakeholders need those results? I have seen so many assessments fail because we get it into the, stake, the, into the hands of the state stakeholders or the decision makers the day before a decision needs to be made. That's not enough time for them to read, process the information, and then figure out how to use that information to make their decision. The other thing that sometimes happens is we'll do this quality of life survey in November, and then we work on the analysis and writing the report, and geez, we get it to the decision makers' finals week of the spring semester. Well, how is that useful? Because those students are going to be checking out of the residence hall and going home for the summer and now none of that information can really be used because you're going to come the next fall with a brand new group of students who are brand new to the residence hall. But if I could do that quality of life survey in November, very quickly put those reports together and get it into the hands of those decision makers just before the start of the spring semester, then as a group of coordinators or as a central administration, then I can look at those reports and make changes that's going to directly impact those students while they're still living with us. And isn't that a better way to get that information to them so that it's useful? And again, isn't something that just sits on your desk and collects dust because they got it to me in a, in a time frame that just isn't useful anymore. And then the last thing related to the project timeline is what makes the most sense for the time it takes to collect that information. And by that I mean, 
you need to figure out within your residence hall community or your institutional culture, when is that time when you're going to get the most results from your students? On my campus, I know if I send a survey out during midterm week, finals week, um, or the week before graduation, I'm going to get a huge response rate because students want to do anything other than study for midterms or finals. Or they've been studying, 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 studying for hours, and they just want a break. And so they're going to go and take my survey. If I set it out the week before spring break or the week before Thanksgiving, I might as well just throw out the results right now because on my campus, they're not engaged at that point, and they're not going to complete that, that survey or that instrument. They're not going to participate in that focus group. So part of the calendar issues is figuring out when can I ask my participants where I'm going to get their attention and they're going to be willing to complete that, that assessment plan. And that takes a lot of careful planning on your part, again, so that you get it collected, analyzed, and reports written by the time the stakeholders need that information too. After you figure out your timeline, think about how this information is going to be used. Is it primarily going to be for an internal audience? Or is it going to be for external audiences, marketing, publicity, uh, benchmarking for accreditation reports? And understanding how those different audiences are going to use that will help, um, help you identify which way to best report that information. How are you going to share the information with your stakeholders? Are they a group that likes statistics, or do they like narratives and stories? Do they just want some students who have participated in the program to come and, and tell their story face-to-face, -face, and then you're going to give some backup statistics? What's the best way to share the information so that you're going to be effective in answering that purpose? The other one is always making sure that you include some implications for practice. At our campus, when we have that information gathered, we pull a group of coordinators together, or a group of res life to get staff together who look at all that information, and then they create some implications for practice so that people can read that report and very quickly scan and say, wow, here's three ways that I can use this information in my job tomorrow. They don't have to process all that on their own. It's already right there in front of them. When you think about reporting considerations, a few things to think about related to your audience is should you do a quantitative or should you do a qualitative approach? For example, my boss, if I throw her a quantitative report that has all sorts of statistically significant and we did this data analysis, she gets this blank stare and goes off in her own little world because she hates it. That's not how she absorbs information. However, if I give her a qualitative research report that has statements and quotes from students and stories, she reads it from cover to cover, and we talk about it at central staff meeting for months because that's how I engage her. I also have a faculty associates that if I go in there with qualitative, anecdotal, and narrative information, they're going to completely blow me off. But if I go in there with a research methodology and statistics and numbers and concrete data, then they're going to listen and ask questions and be excited about the work that we're doing in the resin calls. So thinking through who my audience is and framing my report and what I present in my report in a way that matches who they are is really important. How much time are they going to spend reading results? The higher up you go, the less time they're going to spend. I can guarantee that if I were to hand my senior director a 50-page report, she's going to read the executive summary paragraph. And that's it, because she doesn't have time to read the rest. So I need to get that information to them in as little space as possible, bullet points. I need to put the most important information on the first two pages of the document so that they can scan it very quickly and see what they need to make the decision. How are you going to assign responsibilities? Who's going to design the instrument? Who's going to do IRB? Who's going to do analysis? And making sure that those people have the appropriate training to get it done in a timely manner and figuring out how you're going to hold each other accountable to getting the assessment done. And then at the end, you're going to wrap up with assessing the instrument. So you've collected it, all the data is back, the reports are out, and you're just wrapping it up, getting ready to file that is done, completed, off my to-do list. Spend a few minutes talking about what did you learn about the assessment itself from doing the project? What did you learn about assessment? What did you learn about the project? And keep some notes on that. Were you missing information at the end where you're like, geez, we have this purpose and we missed the mark here, so we need to make sure that next time we ask these additional questions. Are there questions that worked really well or questions that students didn't understand or that didn't get you the information that you thought it would get you? And then are there new directions I need to go on this project or are you really ready to file it away? I take all those notes, I stick them into a folder with my assessment instrument, my report, my data collection, any of the decisions I've made along the way, my assessment plan, 
And I just file it away so that in a year when I pull out my quality of life survey to do it again, I can see exactly what happened last year, what needs to be tweaked, and I don't have to dust off the cobwebs and remember what happened. It's all right there. So that's the assessment planning process. But that can be really scary if you've not done it before, and it can seem like a lot of, a lot of time and energy. So what I wanted to do is give you five or six very quick assessments um, that you can take with you. And if you have a whole government e meeting this evening and you want to know what your student leaders are learning through that whole government process, you could use it tonight. And so let's talk about those examples. The first one is just assessing student learning. There are two different types of assessment for student learning. There's direct assessment and indirect assessment. Direct assessment is what I like to call the product. It's seeing what students are capable to do with their learning. It might be a portfolio or a presentation or a conversation with you. They are demonstrating that they have learned something. Indirect assessment is things you gather about their thoughts, their attitudes, their values. You might be observing them. Um, they might be doing a reflection paper. You might be asking them, you know, did you learn something from this program, yes or no? That's an indirect assessment because they're not demonstrating their learning. What we're going to talk about in the next few minutes are some direct assessments where you can look and see if they've actually learned what you're hoping they're learning through your programs and services. These um, uh, techniques come directly out of the Angelo and Cross Classroom Assessment Techniques book. Um, if you don't have this on your bookshelf, I highly recommend it. It's $15 used, which is about 30% per technique. Um, and most of these techniques you can take right down out of that book, prepare in less than 10 minutes, and put them into place. So it's very little lead time and gets you really rich information on student learning. The categories that CATS use um, go from very basic, such as knowledge, rec uh, recall, understanding, and go all the way up through application and performance for students, problem solving, critical thinking skills, being able to synthesize information, all that information. Now while these categories or these CATS were developed for classrooms, all of them can very easily be adjusted to fit in with our co-curricular learning environment. So the first one I want to talk to you about um, is the minute paper. And I'm sure many of you, if you think back to your graduate student days or your undergraduate days, if you think about that learning experience in the classroom, many of these as we go through them are going to feel kind of familiar for you because your faculty probably were using them to gauge your student learning throughout the entire class. Oftentimes when we think of classroom assessment, we think of term papers, we think of midterm exams and final exams and presentations. But throughout each class, if you think back, your faculty members were really gauging your learning all the way through the process. They might have asked a discussion question in class, and as they listened to those results, they were figuring out if you were picking up on the topic, if you understood the key, the key um, statements or the key points, the key outcomes, or you didn't, where were you confused. Um, and those are the types of informal assessments are what we're going to be talking about here that's going to get you some information on student learning. So again, the first one is a minute paper. And it's really looking or thinking about students' knowledge or recall or basic understanding of whatever topic it could be. So typically what you say is you have them pull out a piece of paper. Sometimes I just give them a note card and say, what is the most important thing you learned today? Or what's the most important thing you learned in the whole government meeting this evening? What's the most important thing you learned in, in the behind closed door session you attended as an RA? What's the most important thing that we talked about in your disciplinary conference today? And they just spend literally a minute writing on what they learned. And you're like, well, what are we getting from that? Well, oftentimes what you find in that is really nuggets of really great information on whether or not students got what you wanted them to get or whether they were completely off topic. For example, we did some minute papers at the end of an RA class on difference. And what they got out of that, what we found from that information is our RAs felt really comfortable understanding differences, but they didn't have any idea how to use their knowledge to communicate with their peers or have conversations with their peers about differences. Well, the whole purpose of the class was to prepare them, them to have those difficult conversations. We missed our mark. They could tell us about difference. They could tell us about groups' experiences, but they didn't know how to talk to their friends about it. And so in just a couple of minutes, we were able to see our learning outcomes weren't being met, so what do we need to do differently? How do we need to prepare different lessons so that they're learning not only about differences, but how to talk with difference and how to talk about um, bias and motivation and critical instance with their students and with their peer group? So very, very quick technique that you can use to get that information. Second one is very similar to the, the minute paper. It's the nuttiest point. 
So this is really, again, recall prior understanding basic knowledge. And it's just asking students to jot down a quick statement related to what is the modius point and whatever. So one of the places where I use this often is behind closed doors for both our professional staff and our student staff. And I'm sure many of you do a behind closed doors practice during your RA training where students get an opportunity to practice confronting situations that they're going to encounter in their residence halls when they're on duty um, or you know, as they're wandering through their community or when they come across a downtown. And so we had them do all these confrontations in the practice, and we provided them with feedback. And then at the end of that training session, I gave them all note cards and said, OK, tell me now, after participating in that process, what's the muddiest point for you? What are you most confused about in all that we've done? And then we were able to collect that information by area, and we were able to find out what specific questions we weren't covering well. We have an elevator protocol on how to respond to broken elevators, and our students weren't quite sure how to handle that situation. They knew how to handle emotional psych really, really well and suicide ideation because we hit that hard over and over and over and over again, but they had no idea what to do when our card readers granting access to the residence hall doors went down. Who do I call? What happens if it's 3 if it's three o'clock in the morning? What happens if it's the only entrance to our residence hall? So being able to find very quickly those areas where students over and over again were confused and then address that in our training was a very quick and dirty assessment that gave us very strong, good information in a way that was reflective for our students and engaging for our students. Because they're also thinking about their experience during this time and figuring out what they're most confused about. Concept maps. Now, I do these a little bit differently than how it's described here, but it's really synthesis and creative thinking. And so in concept maps, you're drawing, doing a drawing or a diagram that's really showing those relationships um, between major concepts, ideas, or values. And we'll talk a little bit later an example in a, in a hands-on practice um, about how concept, concept maps can be used in disciplinary conference with roommate conflicts with RAs. Application cards, um, again, very, very simple. All you need to do is grab some pens and some index cards on your way out the door. I also do this sometimes with post-it notes where they can put them around the room. And sometimes that's a really great visual activity that promotes some additional discussion. But basically, with application cards, students participate in your activity, whatever it may be in your residence halls. And then you just say, OK, um, let's say we're talking about decision making. Write down a real life example of a time when you'd have to make a decision. And how are you going to walk through that process? So they walk through the decision making process in a real life scenario so they can demonstrate that not only do they understand what a decision making is, but the steps in the process that they need to do in order to make a good decision. And so you can see very quickly which steps they're getting and where they're not getting. If they can make an example, if they can transfer that knowledge to other areas of their life, or if, it's, if the knowledge is still specific to a particular learning experience. Um, so again, you can see if it's transferable or if it's limited to the experience or if they're just not getting it. Focus autobiographical sketches are really helpful in RA classes, in living learning communities, or in, um, in student leadership programs. It really assesses student self-awareness. Um, and in the classroom, they say, just write a one or two page sketch, focus on a single successful learning experience. And then faculty can read that to so gauge a student's awareness of how they learn, their understanding of learning, et cetera. The way we use it in our RA classes, we help students think through how their experience relates to the students they're going to be working with. So we start out at the beginning of the semester saying, OK, we want you to write a brief autobiographical sketch of your, um, your early years, your formative years, your years with your family. Talk about your values, your backgrounds, your beliefs, and how those established within your family. And then we talk about that with first year students. Then we ask them to talk about their first year experience in one or two pages. Um, what were the highlights of the first year? What were some of the transition issues? Um, what was some of the learning that occurred outside the classroom for you? And then we take those autobiographical, autobiographical sketches and we discuss them in, the, in relationship to first year learning theory, to the transition from home theory, and, and put it into play and how they're going to use that within their RA role. And then again, we do that later on at the end of the year when we're talking about different talk to me or do a, an autobiographical sketch about how you identify. What, it, what is your identity? What's important to you? What's, what do you value? And then how does that compare to the person sitting next to you, to the people you're going to be working with when you think about difference, when you think about um, 
inclusivity. How does that all fit together? So again, it's assessment where you can see where they're at individually in their development, and you can also see how they're using it and integrating it in the classroom experience and how they perceive their role as an RA throughout the entire year. So very quick assessment um, that's really, again, a great learning opportunity and reflection for the students, but also gives you really great information about your students' learning and development over the course of the year and the semester. And this is my favorite one. I do these, again, in two different ways, chain notes. So um, you want to assess where students' reactions to the teacher, to the teaching. So in this one, I pass around a manila envelope, and I just have a question written on it. It could be anything. It could be, you know, um, what, is it, what are three things you learned as a result of participating in this event tonight? Or, you know, what is three steps in decision making? Who knows? Um, what are three consequences for violating the alcohol policy? And then students just write a note on the card and stick it in the envelope. Um, or oftentimes what we have them do is they write it on the first line and then they pass it quickly to the next person who can add to it or make a new addition, um, new mark on it, or they can add to the person behind them to their statement. And so it continues to be this chain note where students are bouncing back and forth from their ideas to their peers' ideas. And at the end, you're also getting information about what students are learning, what they're retaining, what they're taking away from a session. Um, so in either case, doing those chain notes, again, is a very quick and duty, dirty synopsis of what your students are getting from a particular event and activity. And with all of these, it's very little um, analysis. You're just picking out general themes, um, key statements that stick out often to you, and then using them to improve your practice or your lessons. A few other direct assessments that we use often here um, if you have not gone on and checked out PollEverywhere.com, this is a, a system where you can create a question or a poll or do open comments. We do it a lot in our dining halls if we want to get um, information about um, our food services or our, our options, our menu options. And students can text or um, email in the responses. And so you can see very quickly it's a live poll. So other students can see what, what people, how people are responding and then react to that. They can complete the poll and see live results. So it's a really great interactive way that uses the media and the technology that our students are comfortable with to communicate information and to share ideas in a way that's safe because it's often anonymous. The other thing we do is six word memoirs. Um, and I'm going to share an example of that here in the next section. So basically it's just telling a person who is participating in the assessment, write six words to describe whatever it is you're assessing. Write six words to describe your um, what you learned tonight in the session. Describe, write six words to describe your feeling when you violated the alcohol policy. Write six words to describe um, how you felt after that first confrontation as an RA. Um, and then you can share those, and those themes can be, create some very rich information on where your students are at in the learning process. Finally, we, we call them 30 Second Chance or RA Chats. It's creating some questions where your RAs or your student leaders can go door to door and get information from the resident that provides some face time between the RA and the student. I also have coordinators do this, um, where they can go and say, I have two questions for you. I got 30 seconds of your time, student. Will you answer this? Will you answer that? So you can get very quick information, oftentimes anecdotal, um, but real information in a way that's engaging and building that relationship with the student, but isn't requiring a lot of time or analysis later on. So those are some very quick assessments that you can use in your practice right now, today, as soon as you leave the session. Now what I want to do is do a few examples for you so you can see how this all works in, in action, so you can see how assessment can be successful. Um, so a couple years ago, we have a, a cable contract here for our students um, so that they have access to several cable channels. Our contract is coming to an end, and um, so the, the people who manage the cable contract is like, we're just going to renew it, you know, this is great, everything's fine, we'll just continue on. But we started thinking, well, is this really what we want? Are these really the channels that are most effective for our students? This is going to be a seven to ten year contract. We want to make sure that we've got channels that make, that make sense for our student population. We've got family apartments with a lot of graduate students and international students. Are we offering a multicultural lineup that provides some inclusivity for them and provides some opportunities for their children to learn, for their children to feel like they're seeing people on TV? that they can identify with culturally, um, what do we need to do? So we pull the group together, said our purpose is really to decide what channels should be included in this new contract. We developed some questions that were looking at three different areas. What are the favorite channels in the current um, channel lineup that we had? 
What are those channels that you just don't ever pay attention to? And is there anything that we're missing that you would really like to see on, our, on TV within our residential environment? We surveyed students and all of our different populations on campus, and then we pulled that information together and determined an appropriate channel selection. We realized we had tons of sports channels, and we really only needed a couple of those, and we had very little um, Spanish channels. And our students wanted more of those international channels. Particularly, they wanted soccer. And most of the sports channels we had didn't have soccer. And so we added some additional channels and gave it a semester to try it out before we signed a permanent contract. We sent another survey out to students and did some focus groups and found that the level of student satisfaction with our cable contract had gone up significantly and that there were very few complaints. The other thing that was great about this is we could share how the students who participated in this process impacted change within their living environment. And what we saw as a result of sharing, hey, you guys told us and we listened, we were able to increase the response for many of our assessment projects because students could tell we weren't just collecting that information, we were using it. And they could see how we were using it to improve their personal experience. Another assessment that we did was with our community standards evaluation. We do an evaluation for our students every time they participate in our disciplinary process. And when I first got here, what we did is we asked questions like, how satisfied are you with going through our disciplinary process? How satisfied were you with the outcome of your disciplinary conference? Well, I'm sure you're, what's going through your mind is what exactly went through my mind. Why are we asking these questions? These students are in trouble. They're not satisfied about going through our process. They're mad at us. They just got in trouble. Why are we asking if they're satisfied? Satisfied is irrelevant here. We don't care if they're satisfied. What we want to know is, did they feel respected? Did they feel listened to? Did they feel like they learned something from the experience that's going to benefit them in the future? So we pulled a group together and said, what do we really want to know from students that go through our process? We want to know their learning. We want to know that we respected them. So we completely revised it and got rid of all those satisfaction pro, pro, um, questions that weren't doing us any good. We weren't using them at all. And we developed questions related to customer service. So it was things like, did you have to wait more than five minutes past your appointment time before the coordinator came out? Did the coordinator listen to your side of the story? Did you have an opportunity to review the incident report and provide feedback based on the accuracy of the report? Did your coordinator discuss decision-making strategies with you and the educational conference that was going to help you the next time you found yourself in a similar situation? Did you feel like you were respected throughout the entire process? When we started getting this information back and we started sharing that information, it became evident it was so much more useful because we went and spent time planning and creating the purpose. What we found is we can now look at it and say, wow, there are some training gaps and how we're training our coordinators to do conferences. Our coordinators weren't talking to students specifically about decision-making strategies. They weren't talking with students about their ability to contest a decision. So we were able to go back and modify how we train our new staff so that those items were enforced or, or were um, focused on a little bit more, and we saw those numbers come back in line with where we wanted them to be. The other thing is we could pull it by individual staff member, particularly a new staff member, at four and six weeks into their first semester doing educational conferences, and we could say, wow, this student or this staff member is really struggling um, with, with feeling or with being open to, to listening to students um, tell their side of the story. So then I could go to that staff member and we could sit down and have a conversation with that. We could role play what that might look like, and so we can meet that individual staff member's struggles and work on developing them as a professional, where if it was satisfaction, it would have said, well, I'm not satisfied with this coordinator, and we wouldn't have had any information to make any difference in how that coordinator did their work. One of the muddiest points, I talked about this earlier, and the behind closed doors, um, we always ask students at the end of that um, scenario, as well as our professional staff, because we do a professional staff behind closed doors, what was your muddiest point for you during behind closed doors activity? Write it down. We use the information to facilitate additional discussion right there during the debriefing time. And then we also revisit it during the semester and hit those protocols that were a little muddy at the beginning, often during that first six weeks so that staff feel comfortable with them as they go through and deal with their duty situations. Six word memoirs. We talked about these earlier. Um, we have a sophomore year experience living learning program. Um, in our residence halls. And students who participate in this program, they meet about once a month for a house meeting. 
Uh, sometimes it's a special guest speaker, sometimes it's a program, sometimes it's a service, but they meet once a month. And at the conclusion of each meeting, what we ask students to do, um, and I should back up, these meetings talk about things like entrance to major, typical sophomore um, things, how to get a summer internship, things to consider about studying abroad, um, what happens if I need to change my major, dealing with roommate conflicts, do I want to live on campus or off campus my junior year, all of those types of questions. At the conclusion of each house meeting with one of these topics, what we ask students were to write six words that defined their experience as a sophomore right at that moment. And we kept those six words collectively as a group, and then we separated them out by individual. And what we did then is at the end of the year, we looked at that individual's progression of six words, and then we looked at the group's progression of six words. And we had information that was allowed us to better understand that experience of our sophomores on our campus. We had all the literature out there, but how did that literature um, relate or how is it um, similar to the experience of our own students? And then we were better able to target those educational initiatives based in the community. So what we found is that students are really confused at the beginning of the year. They came off this really focused first year programming and felt lost. Um, the excitement of the first year was gone, but they weren't juniors or seniors yet, so they were just kind of in this limbo. And we could see that in the memoirs and better hit that during the first six weeks that they had that strong community, they had that excitement and enthusiasm continue for their first year. The other thing that I liked about <coughs> the six word memoirs is it allowed students at the end of every session to really reflect on their experience and think about it. So while we were getting some assessment information, they were getting an opportunity to reflect and an opportunity to learn from their experience. We shared them with them at mid-semester and had a discussion with them about their different topics and their different six-word memoirs over the first half of the semester, and then again at the end of the year. And that reflective component with that discussion proved such a useful learning opportunity for our students, and we got good information. So it was really a great assessment tool for us. And then finally, um, our application cards. This just gives you a demonstration of how our students themselves can use these assessment techniques. We have a group of first year students here that are eco reps. They do programs in their first year building. They're first year students themselves, so they're learning how to do programs and events. And one of the things that they do is program about changing other students, their peers, related behavior on sustainability. So how do we teach students to compost more? How do we get them to reduce their electrical usage, et cetera? So this fall, our eco reps, our first year students, did a very simple ice cream social. But once they got the students down to the ice cream social, they had a variety of stations set up that talked to students about how they did the composting on the floors, how they could reduce their energy uses in the building, how the heat system worked in their, in their room so that they could reduce the amount of steam that was used to heat the building, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. At the end of those stations, what they did is they asked students as they were leaving, to write down one way that they could apply the information that they learned in the station in their own residence hall room or on their floor in the next week. So we were able to see, did they get the knowledge? And not only did they get the knowledge, but they, do they know how to apply that knowledge into action in their own community in the next week? And that was something that our students did themselves, and they were able to get information about which areas of sustainability the students picked up the most and which areas they need to revisit in their community over the course of the semester. So just to wrap up, here's some helpful hints as you're getting started thinking about assessment. I hope that today you were able to take away either an activity or a step in the assessment process that will prove useful to you in your day-to-day -day work. The one thing I would suggest is if you're new to assessment is to find an expert on your campus, somebody that really loves assessment and knows assessment and build collaborative relationships with them. I think back to my graduate student days when I first started assessment sitting in that staff meeting and hearing somebody from institutional research talk about that assessment project that we were collaborating on. And I was able to latch on to that and use that office during my entire graduate program to gain skills, experience, and knowledge in assessment to run ideas past them to make sure I was coming up with conclusions that made sense. And that was so instrumental in being able to have a successful assessment process. The other thing is start small. Oftentimes we blow these things up into huge projects and then they're not successful. And then what happens is people say, assessment doesn't work. Assessment just sits on people's desk. Assessment isn't useful. But if you start small, something as simple as the community standards evaluation had a huge impact on our unit 
but it was a very small project. But you know, when people could see how it was useful, now they're ready to jump in and do another assessment project because they found success and they saw it make a difference. The other thing is integrate those assessment activities with your day-to-day -day practice. It should always be part of what you're doing. If you're thinking, I want to start a new initiative, well, what data tells me or what information tells me that students need this new initiative? What information tells me that we're meeting a real need here or that students are really learning here? And integrate that in everything that you do so it becomes not just another task that you have to find time to do, but part of the very fabric of your job and part of the very fabric of your institutional culture. Spend some time de developing that clear purpose um, because it really helps to clarify that methodology. You don't always have to do a survey. Some of our best assessments are focus groups, interviews, and RA chats. Um, those things are so easy to do. The pull everywhere that comes very, very quick, and yet it gives us some of the most useful information. Finally, take a step back often throughout the assessment project and say, hmm, am I collecting useful information or am I collecting interesting information? Because if it's only interesting, we're wasting our time because it's not improving how we work with students. And finally, take time to reflect on that project. It's really, really important. But if you do it again, it can be even better than the last time. So for your homework, what I did is I took those six or seven assessment steps and broke them out here so that you can fill it out as you're working on an assessment project in your hall. And then I wrapped up with a, a table that you can use to, divide, to assign tasks to different people, to set a deadline, to assign who's responsible, to write down what's completed. And then again, during the assessment planning process, what were, what were the comments about developing the instrument? What worked? What didn't work? You can put them right there on the table. At the end, I've got some references, and um, I think this is going to be put up on archives, so you can see that there at the end. And then my contact information. If you have any questions or just want to run something by somebody or, or get a second opinion, please feel free to email me. My email address is right there on the screen, and I'd be happy to respond and get you any additional information. If you don't have that classroom assessment techniques, I highly, highly recommend it. It's very inexpensive and give you a wealth of information that you can use in your residence halls tonight, tomorrow, and through the years to come. And I think that's it. I'll turn it back over to you, Jacob. All right. Excellent. Thank you very much, Amanda. Uh, do we have any questions for Amanda? I see from Eric, our moderator, that we do not have any questions that have been submitted through um, throughout the presentation, but if you have any questions, uh, please submit them now and uh, we'll give Amanda a chance to respond to those. I've got somebody that says, good job, Amanda, and then I have someone else that asks, Amanda, do you schedule time weekly to think or plan about assessment in your daily work? Good question. Um, assessment is a large part of what I do here in my current position, and so I do have the opportunity to plan time weekly um, to think about assessment. But we also, um, as a community, have decided it's not just one person's responsibility to do assessment. So not only do we have an assessment committee that works to look through data and make recommendations for practice, but every time we have what we call a unit meeting, which is where all of our staff get together, we do either a professional development activity around assessment skill building or we're looking at data and talking and thinking and discussing about ways to put it into practice, or we're going through questions and saying, does this make sense? Is this asking the right information? So we do that at each of our unit meetings as well. Um, we've just built that into the culture. The other thing is around our central staff table, we have a weekly central staff meeting, um, and we have a specific item on the agenda each week that is talking about assessment. What assessment is coming up? What assessment do we have currently? And how are we using it in our work? Um, so we've just decided to make that part of our culture here. We have a question from Calvin. He asks, um, the six, for the six words activity, do you ever have students ask you, is that six separate words or a sentence with six words? Um, I do. Um, and we tell them it's whatever they want. So sometimes they do six separate words. Sometimes they do one sentence. Sometimes they do a combination of both. Um, depending on which, which week we're having them do it. So it can be at either or. Okay. And that looks like it for questions at the moment. I do have another, thank you, Amanda, great job, um, sort of mentioned here. So um, 
sounds like they're really excited to implement some of these things with their RAs. Great. Um, well, Amanda, I want to thank you for your time on this wonderful Friday, and uh, thank you to everybody else who was able to attend this webinar today. Um, as Eric mentioned earlier, this will get posted online, so um, if you have colleagues that missed out on this, please um, send them to the Google Kuho webinar archive so that they can check this out. Um, I know Amanda had posted the, the worksheets and, and take-home stuff. Um, those will be going on there as well. So um, I hope everybody has a great weekend, and thank you again for attending. Thank you, Jacob. And just a quick reminder to everyone, we are still accepting registration for the conference. Uh, the Glucuho Annual Conference is in Columbus, Ohio, November 2nd through 4th. And I'm sorry, that's 4th through 6th. Uh, you can register online. Registration is $235. If you have any questions, you can email us at technology at .org. Thanks again, Amanda and Jacob, and have a great afternoon, everyone.